any questions, comments, concerns while we finish getting set up here? Let's see. All right, there we go. That's running. That's recording. All right. So, a couple of housekeeping notes. The, what is it, Unit 7 assignment is due this Friday at midnight. Um, and the Unit 8 assignment is due uh, a week from today at midnight. And then I sent out an email with a uh, sort of tentative schedule for how we're going to tackle Unit 9, which I think has that assignment it's available now. I think the assignment's due at like two weeks from Friday. So. Isn't the one due tonight? No. No? No. I don't think so. Should be one due tonight. Wasn't seven originally supposed to be due tonight? Yes, originally seven was due tonight and eight was due on Friday. Yeah, but it's a big little bit longer to get through the stuff then. So it's due on Friday? It's due Friday. Yeah. Unless um early. Well, I mean, I don't know. Sort of beating a dead horse here, but we're into unit nine now, so surely you should be done with the unit seven assignment. But but I understand. So, any questions about that? Um, everybody is asking, are we going to go over the last question of unit seven? Yeah. So actually, the first thing we're going to do before we start into unit nine today, is so we're going to take a quick detour back to unit seven because there was a question on the like the final question of the unit seven assignment actually covers a thing. Uh, that I completely forgot to talk about. Um, thankfully, though, it's a really easy concept, so we'll just take the first sort of five minutes here and go over it. And what we're going to talk about are, um, I'm going to call it bubbles. The textbook uses this long, uh, drawn out thing. What does it say? It says, you know, gate conversion by alternate uh, logic symbols or whatever. But we're going to call it bubbles. So the way a bubble works, we've already seen bubbles in action. Remember our old friend, the buffer. Right? The buffer doesn't really do anything. It takes x as input and passes it through and gets us x as an output. But if we take our buffer and we add a bubble to the end of it, well, now it's become an inverter. And if we give x on the input, the way you can view it is view it. The way that you can view it is x passes through the in, through the buffer and it hits the bubble. And anytime a signal hits a bubble, it gets inverted. And so we get x prime on the output. So an alternate way to represent our inverter would be to do this. Let's say we have our input x. Let's put the bubble first on the inverter, or on the buffer, just like that. This will have the exact same effect and produce x prime in both cases. So if both of these are equivalent logic gates, um, we just change where the bubble is. The bubble inverts the signal that hits it. So we can apply, well first off, any questions about that sort of as a concept? It's relatively straightforward. There's a bubble, the invert. What's the difference between putting it at the Beginning versus the end. There is none. No, none. Okay. None whatsoever. So is there like in, so there's no added benefit in using nope. either or. No. So if there's no difference in style, maybe. Okay. But really, because of what we're gonna talk about next. Okay. So yeah, on an inverter, it's not very interesting. But if we were to say put it on Let's do an OR gate. So let's start with our vanilla OR gate. It's got A, it's got B, it's an OR gate. It's got an output that's A or B. Okay. Now we've already seen an example of applying a bubble to the output of an OR gate. If we take our OR gate and stick a bubble on the end, on the output node, and we still have A and B. Well, that means we're getting a result A or B prime, right? 
So the signals pass through the OR gate, A or B, and then they hit the bubble, and that gets inverted. So the result is our NOR gate, right? Our not OR logic gate. Now we could put bubbles in all kinds of weird configurations. Let's say we did it like this. We put a bubble on the input from A, but not on B. All right, our result here would be a prime, right? Because the bubble on A or B and that entire expression prime because of the bubble on the output, right? So you can mix and match. You can put the bubbles in different places depending on what you want to do. And the reason you might do this is to sort of simplify your logic diagram, right? If you don't want a bunch of inverters all over the place, you can just stack bubbles where it's relevant, and that would work. Now, what about this, though? If I put an OR gate with bubbles on both ends. So we got A and B. Well, the output here is going to be what? A prime or B prime, right? Morgan's theorem teaches us that A prime or B prime <coughs> is equal to what? A B prime. Yeah, the quantity expression A and B prime. What is that? It's an AND gate. What's that? It's an AND or a NAND. It's a NAND gate, right? So by Morgan's theorem. This is an alternate way to draw a NAND gate, saying bubble bubble core is equal to So an OR gate with bubbles on the input is the exact same thing as drawing an AND gate with bubble on the output. Let's see. This is just like the one on the bottom. Yeah. It really is just like a stylistic choice, right? There's no, if you were to go and build this, like you're still going to build a NAND gate, even if you drew it this way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this, the distinct for us, they're equivalent. What happens under the hood, you know, in a more advanced class, might matter, but for us, they are exactly the same thing. All right. Same thing, by the way, goes for the AND gate. If I put bubbles on my inputs A and B for my AND gate, my result is going to be A prime and B prime, which De Morgan theorem teaches us is A or B prime, right? Which is our NOR gate. So an AND gate with inverted to the input is equal to a NOR gate, an OR gate with an inverter at the output. So if we apply this to our circuit conversion problem, right, where we take a circuit, a multi-level circuit of AND and OR gates, and we convert it to a circuit of NAND gates, we can use this concept of bubbles to make things go a little faster. So say, for example, I've got an OR gate level here, which is got A prime and B, and then I've got a level of AND gates. With C, and then a 
2 put and gate with D and E, and those feed into a 3 input OR gate. And that's going to take F prime, we'll send our output is Z. And we're asked to just convert it to a circuit of NAND gates. Now we're already set up to do this, right, because it's a circuit of AND and OR that ends in an OR gate. So we're good to go as far as creating a NAND gate is concerned, um, or creating a circuit of NAND gates is concerned. But now instead of redrawing everything, all we have to do is just add bubbles. So I'm going to put a bubble there and a bubble there, but I'm going to leave out the bubble on F prime. Why is that? Because it's already prime. Oh, Not that it's already prime. Remember when we do our conversion, all the odd levels, level yeah. one, and level you know level one, level three, so on and so forth, they're all going to get inverted, right? Which means that. Well, it's already inverted. If we did this again, if I added the bubble here, then I would have to take with prime. You got some options, right? So it was because it was already inverted? No. It's because during the conversion we have to invert it. Right. Remember when we convert it to a circuit of NAND gates, any single literals on an odd numbered level have to get inverted. Right. Remember? So since that's the case, we can add the bubble and then invert it like we did here, or you could just omit the bubble altogether, and you still have the same logical effect. Now what about our two AND gates? How do we make those NANDs? It's pretty easy, right? We're just going to put bubbles on the output. And then here, by the textbook, so you can make that an AND gate and AND gate. We would add bubbles here, but also we could have, since this is level three, which is an odd number of levels, so we do the bubbles, and we have to invert them, or we could just left them the way they were and didn't have the bubbles at all. And we would have the same effect. So if we did end up redrawing this, that's just a NAND circuit, and we still get that right, so we can use two of the bubbles. What do you mean? So like this is all the homework, right? Yeah. So if we already redrew it, instead of using the bubbles, we just did all the NAND gates. The question says use bubbles. Does it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The question. The question. If the question doesn't specifically say. This is my answer to this question that I get all the time, right? Which is, you know, how am I supposed to do it on a test or homework? If if I don't specify, do whatever you want, right? If I specify, do whatever I specify. And that question specifically says use bubbles to make NAND gates or NOR gates or whatever. Right. Yeah. So, so that's the concept. Put the bubbles, two bubbles on the, the bubbles on the inputs of an OR gate get you a NAND gate, bubbles on the inputs of NAND gate get you a NOR gate. So any questions about that? All right, let's move on to the good stuff. So we're now in chapter nine, and this course has a bit of a reputation, at least since I've been teaching it, to, at a point in the semester, the difficulty ratches up. If you talk to a friend that's taking this class with me before, they'll tell you, yeah, there's like this place where we go from like zero to 11 on the difficulty scale. Now, I'm not sure that that's true, because I think it's all one sort of continuous slope in difficulty, but if that is true, then that day would be today. Because we're done, with the warm-up. Everything we've done till now has really just been setting us up to do the real stuff, right? In the same way that your calculus classes are really just the warm-ups for your you know, differential equations and later algebra classes. Because um, now we're gonna start to use the tools that we've learned to make real things. Which means you have to have that knowledge and be able to abstract it now into novel circumstances. You can't just copy and paste um, you know, Boolean algebra expressions. We gotta use the knowledge. So now, more than ever, it's really important to be reading the textbook. Take a look at those study, self study problems before you come to class. 
Because, yeah, so if you've been phoning it in until now, you're going to have a tough time. So, but that being said, I don't think it gets that much harder. So, but it's also because I kind of think this stuff is pretty fun. So, let's see. Today we're going to talk about a concept called multiplexers. Muxes, for short. Now, in your computer science or your programming classes, you are probably familiar with a structure that looks like this. If something, then something, else something else, right? Well, we'll see the if else block, the if else structure. A multiplexer is basically just a hardware implementation of this type of structure this type of decision-making structure. What we want to say is if we have, let's say two, what we're gonna call data inputs, because we're gonna make a distinction now between data inputs and what we call control inputs. So data input, two of them, let's say we have I sub one and I sub zero, two data inputs, and we want to get one output Called y, and we want to say that if, well, first, I guess I can say it, we're also going to have to have one control input. We're going to call that C. So if we're going to write this as an if else block, I'm going to say this if C is equal to 0, then y is equal to i sub zero. And, or I can say else now, since it's just one bit, but to be a little more explicit, I'm going to say if again, if c equals one, then y equals i sub one, right? Depending on the value of c, we're going to pick one or the other and pass that along to y. Mechanically, we're going to represent this as a switch. Think back to those very first days talking about logic games. So say I've got i sub 0 and i sub 1 on one end, and I've got y on the other side. I'll draw the switch as normally pointed at i sub 0. Remember, this is where the switch is if there is no signal applied to it. Or more to the point, if c is equal to 0, right? So we model the switch itself with the Boolean variable c, our control input. If c is equal to 0, then the switch stays at i0, and i0 passes along to the output y. But if I set c equal to 1, then the switch clicks over. And now it's at i1, and I pass the value of i1 to y. And that's all there is to it, conceptually. Any questions about the concept of what we're trying to do? We want to be able to control now what outputs we get in addition to just you know manipulating or processing the inputs. So if we want to now build this out of logic gates, we need to first put it into a Boolean expression. So I'll say that y is now is a function of everything here, right? I sub one, I sub zero, and our control. And is equal to, well, let's do it this way. Let's go ahead and just truth table. So let's say, I'm going to say, um, nah, I don't care. That's going to get easier. Let's just keep it simple. So y is equal to i sub 0 when c is equal to 0. So I'm going to say that it's equal, so y is equal to i sub 0 when c is equal to 0. So that means i 0 and c prime. Or it's equal to i sub 1 when c is equal to 1, so I'm going to say i1 and c. Just to clarify that, so if I say c is equal to 0, that will give me y is equal to i sub 0, c prime is equal to 1, or i sub 1 and 0, which means that 
the i is 0. And if c is equal to 1, then I've got y is equal to i sub 0 and 0, or i sub 1 and 1, which means that I've got y equals i sub 1. Now this works out pretty nicely because this is a pretty nice and concise sum of products expression, which will lead us to a really nice and easy two-level um, and or logic circuit. Circuit and give it a name. This is called a two to one box, two to one multiplexer. There are two data inputs, they get selected, and one gets passed down to just one output. logic gates all the time, so as a shorthand, to represent a multiplexer, we'll use a logic symbol that's a trapezoid. On the left hand side here we'll have our inputs, i sub 0, i sub 1, and on the bottom we'll have our control, and then we'll have our output, y. So there's our logic symbol for our two uh, multiplexer. Um, on the first one, could you, instead of putting um, this writing out uh, C prime, could you put the C in the bubble? Totally. Oh, right. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. But only at the beginning, though. So you're saying you could have made this C. And put a bubble right there? Yeah, you absolutely could have done that, yeah. Okay. Alright. What about a four to one multiplexer? While it is possible to make uh, multiplexers that aren't power of two, we don't do it very often. We tend to stick with powers of two, so we're gonna have, you know, four to one multiplexers, eight to one, sixteen to one, thirty-two to one, sixty-four to one. But very rarely will you ever see like a three to one or a seven to one, although it is possible to make them. Yeah. Uh, is the one, do you mean the one output? Yes. Okay. All right, so let's make a four to one. How many control signals will I need? Four. What's that? Four. Yeah, well not four. They only need two, right? There's four possibilities. We need two bits to select them. So let's say that we've got this. F is a function of, or excuse me, Y is a function of, let's say, I, there's four of them, so I is a three, I is a two, I is a one, I is a zero, and then C is one, and C sub zero. And we'll select them again from top to bottom. We'll say that I, so Y is equal to I sub zero times, not times, excuse me, and C one prime and C zero prime. Or I sub one and C sub one prime and C sub zero. 
or I C two and C C one and C C zero prime. Or you could definitely use a, uh, a truth table with this, correct? To distinguish, I guess, so they establish um, different variations. You uh, yes, I mean you could use a truth table, but I mean one, two, three, four, five, six. How many rows is truth table gonna have? Whole bunch, 64. Yeah. So too many. So here it's better to just kind of reason out what's going to happen. Uh, let's see, I3, that had to give us what? C1 and C0. And it kind of makes sense, right? Because if you think of this guy, that's 0, 0, that's 0, 1, that's 1, 0, and that's 1, 1. So if we looked at C by itself, we would say that we essentially have I sub zero anded with, or excuse me, each of the bits of I, each of the input, uh, or excuse me, each of the data inputs, they're all anded with one of the min terms of our two bit C. So we've got M sub zero, M sub one, M sub two, is three if that were its own circuit. So let's see. So now, instead of drawing, because we can already kind of see what the structure is going to look like, right? It's going to have four AND gates, each with three inputs, and the whole thing. So what I do now instead is introduce a concept called bus notation. gives us a little bit of a shorthand because 4 to 1 lux is not even that big and yet it gets pretty unwieldy, right? So we have 1, 2, 3, 4. I0, I1, I2, I3. We've got two separate bits, C1 and C0, and still just the one output. Why? Right? And if we had an A to 1, that's 8 lines and 3 control bits. If we had a, you know, shoot a 64 to 1 multiplexer, that'd be 64 input lines. And what, 6 of these guys, 6 control bits. What we want to do is kind of shorthand it a little bit. And instead we're going to draw it like this. Still the same logic symbol, still the trapezoid. But to represent all of these inputs, we draw one line. Hit a dash through it, and I'll write a 4 underneath. And label it with just I. Same thing for my control. There's two controls. I'll instead write it with a dash and 2, and call it C. And since Y is one bit, it still just gets to be one value on its own. So I is a bus which is to say it contains multiple bits of information. So it itself has I3, I2, I1, and I0. C has C1 and C0. So it's implied if you drew it this way, with the bus notation, the slash and the four, and the slash and the two, that it is this but it becomes a lot more manageable to draw, especially once we have really large values, like 64-bit buses and whatnot. Of using the bus notation if I made you write it out anyway. Sure. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to shut it up. Did you write on the assignment? Yeah. I want to pass. What's that? I want to pass. No, you don't want to pass. You don't care about passing. You want to learn. Both would be pretty good. Well, one sort of feeds itself to the other. I mean, like, come on, you can either pass or you get to be with Mr. Johnson again. That's yeah. Like, yeah, we just hang out here forever. Both are so good. Forever pass. That's what I like. That's the All right. <laughs> so, um, anyway, come get that. Okay, so we've got our mux there. We've got um, our bus notation represent the muxes. And the last thing we want to do is it can get pretty, we still got to build them, right? And it can get pretty unruly to have, you know, 64 AND gates and an OR gate and a 64 bit input. What if you have those constraints like fan in it so you can only have two input things? Um, you need to be able to modularize your logic design. So. That's what we're going to do. Right now, we're going to say, well, can we make a four to one composed of just two to one muxes? And it turns out we definitely can. So let's write out, literally just erase the shouldn't have been there. Control Z, get it back. Okay, so we'll start with our expression for our four to one mux. So that y is equal to i sub zero, c one prime, c zero prime, four i sub one, c one prime, c zero, four i sub two, c one, c zero prime, or i sub three. And C1 and C0. So there's our big four to one mux, and we need to condense it down. And it turns out we can do that because there's some repetition in these expressions. So, for example, these first two terms here both have C1 prime in them. And the second term, second group of terms here, have just C1, not inverted. So we can factor that out and get that y is equal to c1 prime and i sub 0, c sub 0 prime, or i sub 1, c sub 0, close that off, or that is c1, and i sub 2 times c sub 0 prime, or i sub 3 times, or and, c sub 0. So hopefully you can see the multiplexing structure here, right? If C1 is equal to 0, then we get whatever this is. And if C1 is equal to 1, then we get whatever this is. And within them, we have C0 selecting between, in this case, I sub 0 and I sub 1. And in this case, C0 again is selecting between I sub 2 and I sub 3. So if we come over here to build it, See that we're going to get some repetitious pieces. So we start with our first. Result, our first two to one mux, which is going to have i sub zero and c zero prime, yeah, and i sub one and c zero. That's our first. And then we have a second two to one mux. Now this one takes I sub two and C zero prime. The second one takes 
I sub 3, and C0. There's another second encapsulated to one box. And then now it's the one on the outside. So we're going to have the exact same structure, though. That's going to take from that. And what? C1 prime. And the second, 2 to 1 mux. And C1. And our output, Y. So we have three circuits that are exactly the same. They're all just two to one muxes, but combined together, they create a four to one mux. Another way we can draw it is like this. Two trapezoids. I sub zero, I sub one, I sub two, I sub three, and let's see. Both of them pull from C sub zero. And they feed as the inputs with a C sub one control button to our output Y. When we go here in about two weeks and we start learning hardware description language and start coding our logic circuits. This is the kind of approach we'll take. We'll design one module that's just our two to one mux, and then use three of them to make another module that is a four to one mux, and so on and so forth. This is the kind of design approach that we will take to solving those types of problems. Any questions about that? Yeah, I have a question. Um, the two Let's see, Liam asks, I'm confused as to what separates C from any other regular input. In practice, it doesn't separate from any other regular input. An input to a logic circuit is an input to a logic circuit. But we're gonna make a sort of analytical distinction, right? The I's are the data inputs. These are the inputs that we want. This is the result of addition or some sort of operation that happened in the processor or something like that. And the control inputs while still being inputs to the logic circuit are, they tell us, well, what do we want to do with that data? They let us push the data around and control it. So like I said, we're making the sort of philosophical or analytical distinction between data input and control input. You know, data is the numbers that we're working with. Control is the things that we use to control what we're doing. All programming stems from just controlling data inputs, right? So, all right. One last thing to hit today with our last 10 minutes is while we've got some multiplexes here, right? We've got two to one all together. These guys formed a four to one. But there's one limitation here because all of the inputs are themselves still just one bit. Right? But we need to work with information that's 4 bits, 8 bits, 32 bits, 64 bits. How do we expand this multiplexer to be able to select between 64 bit numbers or even just 4 bit numbers? So let's see what's through here. And the way we do it is just by packing in multiple multiplexers all run off the same control inputs. Maybe this kind of illustrate the difference between um, control inputs and data inputs. So let's say that I want to make a four bit, or what we call quad, two to one mux. So it's still a two to one, but we're going to work with four bit values. This means now that we'll have a thing that kind of looks like this. We'll have an input we'll call A, an input we'll call B, 
that they themselves now are buses. My first question is, how many control bits do we need in order to make this work? Three bits. Is it two bits? We got three bits, we got two bits. What else? Is it four bits? No. Oh, would be four. Would be four. How many bits are there? How many control bits did our original two one? Months have? Four. I had one bit. Right? Okay. So the number of control bits is still defined by the selection, right? The answer to this is it's still just one bit. It's still just one bit C. Because we're still, despite the fact that the thing that we're selecting, they are themselves four bits, we're still just selecting between one or the other. We're still making a choice between this or that. So it's still a binary choice. Does that make sense? And that really encapsulates, I think, the difference between a data input in a um, control input. Another thing you can say, so Y on the output here is also going to be four bits, right? In your system, all of your data bits, all of your data signals, your data inputs, your data outputs, they all have to be the same number of bits for the system that you're building, right? Four bits, eight bits, or 64 bits like in a modern processor. But our control inputs are just enough bits to get the job done. So they can be weird things like one bit or three bits or Stuff like that. Well, let's take a look at what happens under the hood. The reality is, and it's just what you'd expect, we're going to have four one bit of our two to one multiplexers. All right? So since A, B, and Y are all four bits, that means that we use bus notation. A is a is 3, A is 2, A is 1, A is 0, right? B is equal to its 4 bits. B is 3, B is 2, B is 1, B is 0. Y is equal to its 4 bits, right? Y is 3, Y is 2, Y is 1, Y is 0. So out here, well, that's what we're going to have, right? We're going to have, up top we'll have, let's say, let's start with 3, right? A sub 3, B sub 3. And that outputs Y sub 3, right? Now, we've already kind of seen this structure before, haven't we? Where did we see this already? It's A sub 2, B sub 2. We saw this when we built an adding circuit. A sub 1, B sub 1, A sub 0, B sub 0, 1 sub 2, 1 sub 1, Y sub 0. And then all of these will take from the same control bit C that has to be C, right? Because you wouldn't want to pick, you know, A sub 3 and A sub 2, but then B sub 1 and B sub 0, right? Because you want to pass all of A through the Y, or all of B through the Y. Right? Because A might be the result of addition, and B might be the result of subtraction. And you're building a thing to do both, and you just multiplex which one's what. So, to make a multi-bit multiplexer, Whatever it says, two to one, you're still gonna have that many, that many bits of the two to one multiplexer. And there we go. That's must. Let's see, the switching structure, I have like two to one, we talked about how to compose larger muxes out of smaller modular muxes. We got multi bits, multi bit muxes by just sort of stacking that many bits of mux onto each other and tying each bit 
to its own sort of counterpart, A3 with B3 goes to Y3, and so on and so forth. But one control bit to drive each MUX so that each MUX is picking the same, the A or the B, depending on what you wanted to do at that time. All right. Any questions, comments, concerns? All right. In that case, that is it for today. Um, I'll see you on Friday, where I think we're going to talk about decoders. So we're going to build some big stuff. Chapter 9 is arguably my favorite chapter of the entire book, because we do some really cool stuff. We're going to talk about ROM. We're going to make ROMs in Chapter 9, so read-only memory. That's pretty exciting. That's a thing you've heard of before, right? Um, what's that? What are we going to learn? Um, how to make things like, uh, like read-only memories. So you've heard, the, you've heard the term ROM of before, right? No? The CS guys probably have. Yeah. We're going to learn how to build them from scratch in chapter 9. I think it's pretty cool. So, all right. So, I'll see you guys on Friday. Thank you.